Hi there. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are today. And uh, welcome to the 44th International Conference on Telecommunications and Signal Processing, uh, virtual conference uh, again this year. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to give this invited uh, talk at TSP 2021. Uh, my <clears throat> history with TSP dates back, uh, I think first time I went to TSP was in 2018 and it was in Greece and uh, I had a really good time and I met a, lo a lot of really good colleagues that I, I still work with today. And I also attended TSP in 20. 19 in Budapest and again it was a really good time and got to reconnect with a lot of the colleagues that I had met the year before and so my history with TSP is I wouldn't say a long time because TSP is now 44 I think years old but uh, you know I, I really appreciate uh, meeting people at TSP and it's a great place for for students and young uh, junior researchers to, to meet people and start to work together. And so uh, every year I try to either submit a paper or, you know, attend TSP when it's in person. And so I really appreciate this opportunity today to give my invited talk on uh, some of my research that uh, I, I'm working on right now. So just let me formally introduce myself. My name's Gautam Sarastava. I'm from Canada. I work at Brandon University. I also hold some adjunct research positions at Lakehead University and China Medical University in, in Taiwan. Lakehead's in here in Canada. And so my, my talk today is going to be focused on uh, blockchain technology, which is one of my main areas of research and its future in you know, it, it says on the in the title "Internet of Medical Things." Uh, in essence, we can we can kind of simplify that and say the future of blockchain technology uh, in in medicine itself. And so, I'm hoping uh, that my my slides will also be available to you if you if you wish to have them or or follow along. And uh, my contact information is down here at the at the bottom here. So feel free to contact me if you find any of this research interesting and maybe want to want to work together on something. So okay, let's get started with uh, the the actual talk. So <clears throat> what am I going to talk about today? So basically, blockchain technology in itself is, is more of a kind of a black box. Uh, that we've been seeing over the years being applied to uh, different different areas of application. So at its basically at its infancy, blockchain technology found a home in finance. And then now we're seeing through research and in industry, blockchain technology being applied to a bunch of different uh, areas. So for example, you know, the government, not all governments, but some governments are interested in blockchain technology for a way to uh, do certain things. And we'll talk about what those things are a little bit later on. We've seen blockchain technology be applied in the energy sector, uh, again, trying to achieve some of the same things it tries to achieve in, in finance. And so, you know, in, in this talk today, I'm going to focus on the internet of medical things. And so what is the internet of medical things? Well, we, if you're listening to this talk, you're probably not uh, unaware of the internet of things where we're basically trying to connect devices to each other through wireless and connected networks so that devices can communicate with each other. You take that basically overlying idea of internet of things and you basically take a subset of that and now look at things that would be connected in the medical domain. So, you know, different types of devices that would measure heartbeats or measure your blood pressure. Uh, 
uh, sensors on our bodies that we wear to to measure different things. And now you're trying to connect those uh, <clears throat> on the internet or basically through some sort of wireless communication. Now, all of a sudden, you've got this idea of what the internet of uh, medical things is. And so, we, if, I mean, if we had unlimited time, I'd, I'd probably talk about the all sorts of different applications uh, within within healthcare and and medicine, but I, I'm just for this for the sake of this talk, I'm I'm just going to focus on 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 three. Uh, the first being drug traceability. That's probably what I'll spend the most time on once we go through the background, and then uh, it's a it's a it's abilities in clinical trials and research, and then the third thing would be data management. The reason I've picked these three for today is because I feel like with the pandemic, uh, with the vaccines, uh, which are a hot topic right now, I think these three topics would prove most interesting. But it, it's three of, of many that I, I could have talked about. And, and if there's questions, you know, after the talk and stuff, maybe we can get into some of the other, other things. So let's start by talking about uh, blockchain technology. And so when we're talking about blockchain technology, uh, what we basically saw was uh, we, we, we saw this technology kind of start in, in cryptocurrency, so Bitcoin. And so this idea of blockchain in itself was based on a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, that that's main feature was, was something called a distributed ledger. So basically to account for different transactions in cryptocurrency, this distributed ledger was able to account for transactions with that specific currency. And so what that was hoping to accomplish was a realm of transparency and trust because the distributed nature of the ledger basically meant that everyone that was actively involved in the cryptocurrency would have a have a copy of this ledger and so all the transactions would be transparent and the trust factor comes in the fact that every transaction needs to be verified and to verify transactions on a blockchain you use something called a uh, proof of something or basically a uh, procedure where a group of members that are actively involved in the verification of transactions verify the transaction and once we have a consensus on that transaction it gets added to the blockchain and so the three main components of blockchain then are this distributed network which contains the different players or basically people that are involved in the in the in the network or in whatever the blockchain is storing in its infancy was cryptocurrency the shared ledger which everyone has a copy of and these uh, this idea of digital transactions now with the digital transactions the cryptocurrency transactions were uh, financially based but you can see how this idea of, uh, oops, sorry. This idea of, this idea of a transaction, we can basically redefine and say that that transaction that we're storing on the blockchain can be just about anything. Anything that we want to be, anything that we want to have as verifiable anything that we want some sort of trust in. And the other key factor here is anything that we want to be immutable. And by immutable, what we basically mean there is that we can't change it. Once something's on the blockchain, the amount of effort it would take us to change something is astronomical. And so we basically would consider that as infeasible. And so those different conditions kind of make blockchain an attractive technology in different sort of fields. And so in all of a sudden now, when we kind of jump into medicine or medical field, we're all of a sudden dealing with a lot of private information. And so your information as a person 
is often shared with medical practitioners or, or different sort of things when you go to the doctor, but you don't necessarily want people to know about that. And so the, the medical field all of a sudden becomes a, a major positive backdrop for blockchain because we want things to remain private and we may want things to remain unchangeable, but at the same time, we may want to share information amongst different players in the medical field. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But what we saw is that people saw how basically valuable blockchain could be in medicine. And so the funding backdrop basically took off. So we had a lot of what are called, um, you know, investors and different sort of IPOs came out that had to do with uh, medical blockchains. And so that's kind of how this blockchain and medical technology kind of took off. So remember I talked about the three, one, two, three main ideas behind a blockchain. Well, the first I mentioned was the distributed network. So basically this peer-to-peer -peer network where, basic, where information can be shared uh, and nodes in the network are, could be considered as people that are invested in whatever the blockchain, the information that the blockchain has or wants to share. And so each member then has this uh, copy, identical copy of the blockchain. And basically this identical copy uh, leads to the collective process of validating and certifying digital transactions on the network. So everyone that's on the network has the ability to verify transactions that want to be added to the blockchain. So that was that was the first part. The second part was this shared ledger. The shared ledger is the information that we're tracking or basically in, in cryptocurrency, the transactions or whatever information that you want to store on the blockchain. And so members in the distributed network from the first part record digital transactions into the shared ledger. And so to add a transaction, base, members need to run network algorithms or run algorithms to basically prove uh, the, the validity or basically the ver verification process of the transaction and to evaluate its, its legitimacy. And so if a majority of people in the network or nodes in the network think that the transaction is valid or sign off on the transaction is valid, the transaction gets shared to the blockchain. Okay. And so creating the shared ledger, which in fact is the blockchain, is a process that everyone that's involved in the network can get involved in if they so choose. So <clears throat> Changes to the ledger then are reflected in all copies of the blockchain. So when we try to add transactions, they get those added transactions get sent out to every uh, node that has an active copy of the blockchain. After a transaction is added, it is immutable, which basic, which means, as I said before, we can't change it or remove it. And so once something gets added to the blockchain, it's permanently etched in the blockchain. You can see how that could be a big positive for if information that we want to keep on the blockchain, we want to make sure that people can't change it. Since all members in the network have a complete copy of the blockchain, no single member has the power to tamper or alter data. So we create this situation where we add these transactions to the blockchain but at the same time, no one can change them. And so what we see over time is a lot of verified important data that could technically be stored on the blockchain. Now, the other third thing were, was the transaction. So the digital transaction. So in essence, any type of data can be stored on the, on the blockchain or any sort of digital asset. And so I don't think over time, especially if our blockchain was looking to grow really big, that if we had a bunch of like really big JPEGs or images or videos, we'd wanna store those on the blockchain. But later we'll talk about ways that we can get around that uh, and still keep our information in a way so that it can't be changed or altered, 
Okay. And so transactions are structured into blocks and each block contains a cryptographic hash to the prior block. The reason for the cryptographic hash is to connect the blocks together. And so if I take a hash of the entire block, if you know anything about hashing algorithms, you know that they usually have some sort of fixed size. And so this, in this manner, we can create base, uh, links between uh, different blocks to create the chain. And so the blockchain then could look something like this, where we have this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer architecture. So these aren't all different blocks. These are all, you can consider these as nodes. So this could be an N1, node two, node three, node N, node four, and so on, okay? And they all have identical copies of the block. If a new transaction gets added, we see over a few seconds that transaction basically would appear on everyone's block. It would be an identical copy uh, of that information. And in that sense, everyone's block over a period of a new transaction getting added to a block would mirror each other. And what we would see then is the, these blocks that every node n to the sub i would have would be, would be identical to each other. And so each member then, or each node in this case, in this drawing that I've, that's on the screen, stores an identical copy of the shared ledger and changes to the shared letter are reflected in all copies, which I've kind of shown you there. Okay. Okay, good. So the other thing that I talked about was hashing the blocks together. So what you're basically looking at here, you may consider as one block but we want to have multiple blocks, full blocks. So once this is full, I need somewhere to store the next batch of information that would go into another block. And I need to basically connect these together. And so transactions contain encrypted and digitally signed data. So each of these transactions then would have some sort of part here that could be encrypted or digitally signed so we could verify it. If we were storing the raw data, we would need that. And so we would also have a hash from the previous block that would connect it. So this, so say this was block B1, this would have hash function of B1, which we could then verify B1 with. So if you don't know anything about hash functions or you don't work in security, what I can tell you right now is the fact that if you have if you have a piece of data so let's just take a simple example we're looking at a word file we have a word file it's got a bunch of content in it and i run that word file through a hash function and so i have this word file dot docx right i run it through this hash function and i get out on the other side some you know, depending on the size, some fixed fixed length hash of that word file. So let's just give it uh, some, so maybe it's like, uh, you know, F A one, two exclamation point dollar sign. Okay, so that's the hash of this word file. If someone else takes the same word file and runs it through the same hashing function, they should get that same hash, okay? That's how we can basically verify that they have the same file that I do. Now, let's take another file, word file, word1.docx. And in that word1.docx file, I changed just one letter. I changed the word the to the word he, for example. And so when I take that file and I run it through the hashing function, what comes out on the other end is going to be completely different. So basically not equal to the hash of the other file. So in that sense, what we can basically do with hash functions is verify contents of a file or an image or something, some piece of data so as to make sure that no one has changed it or altered it. And the nice thing about hash functions is they give us this fixed size output and these fixed size outputs can be very handy when I need them, okay? Okay.
moving forward. So let's talk about medical data. And one of the things that we need to know about medical data. So if you've ever been to a doctor, which I'm assuming at some point in your life you have, you'll know that doctors, medical pr practitioners, as I'll call them, because now, especially in North America, we're seeing that nurses and doctors and nursing practitioners all can, you know, prescribe medicine and do a bunch of the same stuff. So what we know about medical practitioners is they like to keep data. They like to keep data on you and they like to keep data on the procedures or the examinations that they've given you. And so what we see from medical practitioners is a whole bunch of different types of data. If you're wearing a sensor that's measuring your blood pressure, you'll have one type of data. If you go into the doctor and he physically takes your blood pressure, which is doing the same thing as a sensor, he's probably gonna write it into some chart and all of a sudden that same data is represented in a totally different way. Okay. The other thing is if you're whole, if you wear a smartwatch and your smartwatch keeps a bunch of different facts about you, it's being stored in a different way as well. So we have all these different types of data. And so what we see in, in medicine is original data of any size and format comes about. There's no normalization of the data. So that whole process of having all these different types of data has the generic term of a data lake, okay? Because that data, once it's collected, thrown into the pile of basically data about patients can be treated as a data lake because it's basically a collection of all different types of data. And so the, I guess not negative point, but a point to be made here is we want to be able to analyze that data through queries, through interactive queries, real, real time analytics, machine learning, AI, deep learning, all sorts of stuff we want to do on that data. But it's coming in in a whole bunch of different forms. And so we need ways to be able to analyze data. So these are all analysis types. But we also need a way to make sure that the data that I'm analyzing is the original data. It hasn't been changed. There's nothing been done to the data that basically would tell me that this data is not valid anymore. And so that's kind of where the idea of health blockchains in general kind of comes in. So we have all, this is, you can think of this and you'll see a bunch of key words here that you probably know. Someone in your family at some point in their life has worn a heart, heart monitor. Someone has visited a doctor. You've had prescriptions before, most likely. Uh, if you've been unlucky in your life, you've probably had an MRI done on, on some body part. Uh, nowadays, we're seeing a lot more biosensors. We're seeing blood pressure monitors, lab results. Okay, that this is our data lake. And so the key to how any sort of Internet of Medical Things blockchain is we're not going to store all this information on the blockchain. That would be impossible. Why? It's impossible because of all the different forms, all the different sizes that it comes in. Okay, something in here would be an image. So an MRI is not text data. It's, it's, it's image. It's imagery. And it's not just imagery. It's high definition imagery that takes up a lot of space. We don't want to store that on the blockchain. Okay, your blockchain will get huge. Okay, think about storing all that data on the blockchain, everyone's MRIs, that thing would get massive really quickly. We don't want to do that. Prescriptions, probably really small amount of data, okay? Really, really tiny because there, if you've ever gotten a prescription, you can kind of read on the prescription that, you know, you know, we're talking about 200 characters at the max that can we do that. That may be something that we want to store on the blockchain. But the key is, how do we store both of these things on the blockchain at the same time? That's, that's the issue. And so what we do is we are going to move all of this information that I've kind of circled here somewhere. And we're going to call that your health records. That information can be stored on a whole bunch of different ways. 
Uh, we could store it, say, maybe on a central server. We could store it on the cloud. We could store it in a combination of a central server and a cloud. It doesn't matter, but that's our data lake. What we do, and this is kind of how we use the blockchain, we're going to use the blockchain to verify that data and to make sure that that data remains immutable, okay? And so how are we going to do that? Well, I've kind of given you the, the building blocks already, and I've kind of told you kind of in, in past slides what we're going to do. Every time that we move something to the data lake, say we're moving an MRI to the data lake, what we're going to do at the very same time, we're going to encrypt and digitally sign it. We may even take the hash of it. Well, the hash is going to give us some sort of a, you know, a fixed bit output that we're going to consider as the transaction along with some other information, maybe a timestamp, some other personal information. Maybe not. It really depends on the data. But we're going to take that. We're going to encrypt and digitally sign it. The encrypted digitally signed version, we're going to, with the hash, we're going to move to the blockchain, okay? Because that encrypted and digitally signed hashed version of the data is going to be of a, of a manageable size. So even if it's a, you know, six gigabyte image, when I take the hash of it, I'm going to get some 128-bit, 256-bit piece of information that I'm quite confident I can handle a lot of and store it on the blockchain. And so, so what we're going to see on the health blockchain then is a list, some sort of a list of all health, health records and data collected throughout a patient's life. Okay, so the patient ID needs to basically be in there somewhere for each transaction. And so we can search then later at the health blockchain and basically buy patient ID and get all of that information. Then the data lake is going to store the raw original data that was collected in these different health information providers um, ways. So health monitors, doctors, prescriptions. Whenever I want to verify if that data is valid, I can pull it out of the data lake. I can take the hash and I can compare it to what was stored on the health blockchain. And by doing that, then all of a sudden, I have a way to see if what's stored on the data lake was the original version that we put on the health blockchain back whenever that we put it on there. That's the basic idea behind blockchain technology and in, in healthcare. What you're looking at here is not a specific example, but more of an overlying example, say for a patient. In, in the internet of medical things, what we may see is more specific uses of the same idea. And that's what we'll basically talk about a little bit later on. But that this is what we're, we're, we're working on here. You probably have questions about this. You probably wanna discuss this a little bit with me. So maybe we'll wait till after uh, I'm done to talk, about, to talk about that. So here's a, a, a you know, it's the same, it's the same image just giving you an idea of what actually happens. Okay, patient uses mobile, this is just one example. Patient uses mobile device to assign access permission to data and to provide public key. So once the patient's data is on the data lake and the health blockchain, a patient then has the rights over their own data. They give the public key because remember the data was encrypted before it was put on the data lake. And that basically gives the health provider access to that information. The health provider, uh, provider can then use the health blockchain to ensure that the data that they're looking at for the given patient hasn't been changed or anything like that. Okay, and so that's just kind of one example of, of what is happening. Okay, so obviously I'm gonna share my slides with you and You'll, you'll be able to take a deeper look at some of this stuff. So, I mean, here's just, it's the same information that we've kind of looked at already. Now we're, I'm adding in the idea of, you know, insurance. There's insurance providers that may want access to your data. And so how would they bill you based on, on that? And that's kind of what this slide is, is getting into. So 
just as an overview, think about the idea that, okay, well, patient, you know, patient has some medical tests done. The doctor wants access. So they share, she shares her private key with the doctor. The doctor gets access, some other doctor, not the doctor that took the test, but some other doctor. Remember, one thing to mention now is we're getting into a lot more what, what's called remote patient monitoring. And so as a person, oh, as a person, you may go some place X to get a test, but doctor is somewhere completely different, but he wants access to your, your, your records. These things put together would allow them access to that. Okay, so this example here kind of talks about once a doctor has looked at you and you've had the test and you, you've, you've been billed, then a insurance company or someone that's involved with actually paying your medical bills could get involved to make sure that you're compensated or reimbursed for any sort of medical um, medical costs that you've incurred. That's kind of how things work in Canada here. So you can see here, you know, the different types of services and devices that could be used to create or basically collect the data. Uh, and so on, on your own, on your body, you may even have different types of sensors and implants that could collect data. Those things basically go together to be encrypted and signed. The raw data goes on the data lake, encrypted obviously, okay, with your personal, some sort of encryption key. Then we verify it with the blockchain using a hash. Okay, so the encryption happens here hash happens here. And then when healthcare providers want access to the data, they can verify it. They can verify what's on the data lake using the hash function and then compare it to what was indexed or basically stored on the blockchain. That's it in a nutshell. And so, you know, that's just one example. Uh, some of these slides kind of are repetitive and get into some of the same information. What are the advantages of doing things this way? Okay, what sort of benefits could we possibly? Experience so first of all, blockchain technology offers many advantages for healthcare overall, we're looking at one that has to do with patient information we will actually look at a bunch of other ones a little bit later on, but first of all blockchain is open source no one's actually controlling the workings of a blockchain. So anyone can access it, anyone can implement it. That's great. There's open APIs that a company or a medical provider or an insurance company, whatever, whoever wants to use the blockchain in the medical field could get a hold of. When things are open source like that, they're constantly improving. But on the other side, these components that people can use to implement a blockchain facilitate faster and easier interoperability between systems. So that's what we saw with the data lake. We have all these different systems that could be collecting data, but at the end of the day, once the data is stored on the lake and we basically store the transaction information on the blockchain, anyone can access it after that, provided that the patient has given their consent. And so any sort of health blockchain that should be developed should be developed as an open source thing. However, that being said by me right now, what we're also seeing is a lot of private companies or private insurance companies running their own blockchains in the background without giving access to people. So that's, you know, that's a, there's permission and non permission blockchains, you know, both can be used in the medical field. I'm not saying that both should be used all the time, but there are certain scenarios where you probably want a non permissioned or a permission blockchain. Okay. And so open source software is usually peer reviewed software by silk skillful experts. So once open source software is used and we have access to that, we, we would experience reliability when it came to the medical profession. Obviously using encryption, if you know anything about security, you know that the actual encryption algorithms are common and well known. It, the, the security comes in the form of the key. And so that's kind of the thing that we'd wanna, wanna protect here. So before we get into the use cases, this this information here that's on your slide basically is is summing up the fact that blockchain technology can be a useful technology in the medical field and i've kind of shown 
uh, through some examples so far what that actually looks like. And so what blockchain technology is looking to address in the medical field is the interoperability challenges. There's so many different providers of information, collectors of information, ways that information are collected in the medical field. Blockchain can help tie all that together. And so that's where we would basically see the main benefits with blockchain technology in the internet of medical things. So the next thing I wanna do in this, key, in this talk is, is go through some use cases. And I'm, I'm starting to uh, run out of, of time. So I'll try to get through these rather quickly. And so different use cases of blockchain in healthcare or in internet of medical, fills, uh, medical things has the potential to substantially impact healthcare overall. Whether your country is, has a well-established medical sharing infrastructure, whether it's lagging and needs to uh, improve, blockchain can help in both, in both areas. So today's here, today is Monday that I'm recording this lecture. On Saturday, I had my second vaccine shot uh, for COVID. And so the vaccines here in Canada, although late, have been rolled out rather quickly once, once things started. And so once you had your first vaccine shot, within two months again, you could book for your second vaccine shot. Here in Canada, they kind of touted three different vaccines. AstraZeneca was the first one that came out. Then hopefully I spell these right. There was Pfizer and then there was Moderna. Okay, so you were supposed to get two shots. So you had a first shot and then a second shot, okay? And so a lot of people got AstraZeneca first shot because it was the first one that kind of became available here. But then the government completely abandoned AstraZeneca, okay? They stopped offering AstraZeneca for whatever reason. Obviously, if you do some digging, you probably know why. And so now you are kind of left with uh, Pfizer and Moderna. And so you could get a second shot of Pfizer and Moderna, usually within two months. Now, one of the key factors here with the vaccine was the traceability of the uh, medication. Because two things we knew about uh, the, the COVID vaccines, they needed to be kept at a low temperature. And we saw not necessarily in Canada, but I don't actually know, but we saw in the third world, a lot of counterfeiting of these drugs and, you know, counterfeiting of drugs is nothing new. It's been going on for as long as medication has been available. And so different manufacturers have taken different steps to avoid counterfeiting. But the, the main thing that comes out of what I'm talking about right, to, right now is the idea of drug traceability. And so in, in developing countries, counterfeit drugs kind of run rampant. And so they say that 20 to 30%, 10 to 30% of drugs in developing co countries are counterfeiting. And, you know, I've, I've experienced this. I've gone to developing countries and requested, you know, from the pharmacy, some even over the counter drug. And so a lot of times I get this, you know, what all intents and purposes looks legitimate, but later to find out that it was counterfeit. It has the active ingredient in it, but it's not actually the drug from the actual manufacturer that it says on the bottle. But you can see how with the COVID vaccine, this would be problematic because you're, you're, you're placing your life in these, in these vaccines. And so you want to make sure that you get a genuine item. And so the, the two countries listed here, not to pick on them or anything, but China and India have been well known for creating these counterfeit drugs. And so usually they have the active ingredient in it, but at a lower dose. Now, how can we use blockchain to prevent this? So drug traceability efforts must connect multiple partners within the supply chain. So when you actually get the COVID vaccine, 
it's not the manufacturer that's giving it to you. It's some practitioner of medicine or some nurse that's injecting you with, with the vaccine. But to get to, to get to you, to give it to you, it's gone through this supply chain from where it was manufactured. So it, you know, somewhere it was manufactured. So the drug was manufactured here and it was administered he over here to you or me or someone, okay? It was administered over here. But along the way, it's taken a bunch of different stops because to actually get to you, it's had to go through what they call the supply chain. And so with the supply chain, we need to be able to track and trace the environment. Blockchain can do that for us because it provides uh, internet of medical things network where drugs can be tracked and traced. And so the security that could be added from blockchain and a drug traceability infrastructure is, is huge. And so manufacturers would mark medications with unique codes. We would score that code on the blockchain. Every time that code was scanned, we would say where it was scanned. And so later, once it reaches its final destination, we could go back and look using something called a smart contract, which we won't have time to, to talk about much today. But if you're interested, you can look at it. We could use a smart contract once it reaches its final destination to make sure along the way it met all of its checkpoints for a given drug. And so when a drug is administered that say is counterfeit, it wouldn't have gone through all of those checks that would be stored as transactions on the blockchain. And in doing so, it would not pass the, what they call the litmus test for, for drug traceability. So that's one area. It's very interesting. Uh, I've written a paper on it. Let me uh, just, well, I mean, you can go and find it. Uh, I've written a paper on, on this blockchain and drug traceability. You can you can look it up if you're if you're interested, or we could talk about it in the question period. So, another area is clinical trials. Again, I'm going back to vaccines today because the COVID situation went through clinical trials. Now, a lot of the clinical trials at some point in the media or by anti-vaxxers were accused of being you know really fast and may have been manipulated along the way. So when people are doing clinical trials, they keep data uh, on the clinical trial. And as long as the clinical trial data and the tests kind of pass, they go through different stages and eventually a drug would go from basically experimental to um, approved for human consumption. So along the way, many people touch this data. Touch this data basically means They've been involved in the process of getting a drug approved. And so using a blockchain, then the clinical trial environment can be authenticated. So when a report is written by a person and that person has signed off on it, again, we can authenticate it, we can verify it, we can store a copy of the hash of that authenticated report on the blockchain. And then at the end, we can make sure that everywhere along the way, all the reports, all the data that was gathered can be verified and can be authenticated. And so this allows for a complete reproducibility and secure data sharing among research communities. So a lot of times what we even saw in the clinical trials was data being shared amongst different sites that were uh, involved in the clinical trials. Blockchain can provide us with a, um, an avenue to basically be able to verify securely and validate results. And so clinical trials would be another thing that blockchain in, in internet of medical things could be very important. And so there's some more information here on, on this. So, you know, there's different things that you may wanna look at if you look at the slides, but basically using some really simple techniques and the blockchain and a hash function, we can make sure that clinical trials are um, verifiable and authentic. So <clears throat> lastly, the last thing that I want to talk about, which is probably the most important thing for uh, IOMT, Internet of Medical Things, patient data management. 
And so managing patient data uh, requires complete access to an individual's medical data. And so records need to be looked at by either doctors, nurses, you know, clinics, this, that, the other. But there's no standard way to collect and store data, unfortunately. Here in Canada, we have standard ways amongst different provinces. So states, kind of like states. So I live in a state called, or a province called Manitoba. We have a certain way of doing things, but all the other provinces have different ways of doing things. And so there's no standards for storing or disclosing of information. This is where things can get problematic because with our medical patient information, we, for all intents and purposes, want to keep that private and only want to share that with people that we want to see it. And so the blockchain can provide a secure structure where you, you control your own data with the private key that we talked about earlier, and you only share information to who you want to have access to that data. Otherwise, the encryption secures it in a manner that not everyone can view it. And in, in this way, and again, we see the term smart contracts here, and I'm really sorry, I didn't have time to fully explain it, but in short, a smart contract is something that we can implement, kind of unleash on a blockchain to look for certain things. So if we had a blockchain that only stored your heart rate as a patient, we can invoke a smart contract that would be able to catch when your heart rate was going outside of the normal realm. And if it does go outside of the normal realm, we could have some sort of an alert that would be sent to medical practitioners, maybe the hospital, maybe 911, so that they'd be able to help you. But here, this is the key to patient data management. Patients control access. Okay, you have your public or your, sorry, you have your private key. You only grant access to your data who you want to grant access to you. Not everyone would have access to it. In this manner, through personal health records and encryption, we can create an environment that allows patient data to remain private and secure. And Again, I have another paper on this uh, that you can either look up or, or we can talk about it during the question period, okay? So that's some of the main issues uh, with patient. So, I mean, the three main things that we kind of talked about uh, were patient data management, drug traceability, and uh, clinical trials as far as internet of medical things go. But there's a whole slew of other things that we can, you know, talk about uh, as well. So these electronic health records kind of fall under the patient data management realm. That would be somewhere where blockchain could be uh, used. One thing that we didn't have time to really get into, but is very important, are devices. And so nowadays, everyone's devices are connected to the internet. And that's kind of what the Internet of Things is. In the medical realm, once you walk into the hospital, every person that works in the hospital has a device that's connected to the Internet that allows doctors, nurses to pull your information onto those devices. On, on another note, a lot of the medical devices, so say like a heart rate monitor that's in the hospital or some sort of uh, device that uh, tracks what medications get pumped into your, uh, into your blood if you're a patient that's in the hospital, all that stuff is connected to the internet. The problem is with a lot of these medical devices, and so I'm talking about hospital medical devices right now, hospital medical devices, they are running, even though they're connected to the internet and they're able to share information, they are running really old operating systems. Believe it or not, one of the most common operating systems that's run in hospital devices is Windows NT. Do you remember the last time Windows NT came out with a new release? It would probably be around the year 2000. So you can see, or you can think about the security level of a device that sharing your personal patient information 
in a hospital, internet of medical things environment, what sort of security would be on that device? Or on in, in other terms, what sort of ability would a malicious attacker have to attack such a device, okay? Think of it that way. And so blockchain, okay, verifiable devices, this is another area that we didn't get a chance to talk about today, but verifiable devices can be authenticated using a blockchain, okay? And so what we would create is something called a blockchain network. The blockchain network would authenticate devices to be or basically gain access to the network. And those devices would need to, over a period of time, we could set the amount of time, need to re-verify themselves and re-authenticate themselves to stay on the network. We've seen examples of this in, in different areas that don't necessarily use blockchain. What blockchain may be able to do in this scenario is provide more of a secure uh, way in which devices could verify themselves where their information or basically their ability to connect to the network could be verified or uh, could be uh, looked at later to make sure that it was authentic. So in closing, you know, that's another thing that could be looked at uh, as a use for blockchain in the internet of medical things. So just as a closing point, what I'll say is that in the realm of telecommunication, where we see devices communicating with each other all the time, focusing on the medical telecommunications, blockchain can have a home. And so I've kind of laid out a bunch of different, you know, use cases and, and ways in which it can happen. You know, it's it's yet to be seen what directions that will this will all take, but what is for sure is that heavy investments are going on looking at ways that blockchain can be utilized in, in the medical field. So I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, we can discuss this offline, uh, either you know virtually in the conference or through email. I'm just gonna put my email up again, or it might be better just to go back to the first slide. That might be easier so you can see it. And so here, I'm just going to, um, how do I do this? Clear, erase all ink on slide. Okay, so here, that's my email. Uh, get in touch with me if you wanna discuss this further, we can talk about it. Uh, this was, according to the schedule, this was one of the first talks that was available in the conference. So enjoy the conference. I hope you meet a lot of people during these virtual sessions and take this as an opportunity to collaborate with new people. And so for me, as far as research goes, research is all about collaborating with other minds because different people think differently. And so when you start collaborating with people that think differently, your research automatically has an avenue to improve. And so the theme of, of this year's TSP was the age of artificial intelligence. And so take this as an opportunity to look at different ways in which AI can be used in, in your research. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to my talk. And I hope you all the best in your future research and future endeavors. And I hope you really enjoy TSP 2021. Finally, I just want to thank a really close friend of mine, Norbert, who is uh, the main organizer of TSB for allowing me to come and share my ideas. And uh, yeah, Norbert really appreciate the opportunity. And I wish everyone good luck with their talks and presentations at this year's conference. Thank you very much.